Okay, Temporal here, and today we've got a question from our client who is 33, married, was laid off four and a half months ago, and was making 78k as a project manager at a recognizable company. Uh, it actually seems like it would have been a cool company to work for. I, I am going to keep that quiet, though, because I don't want you, I don't want viewers being able to figure out who you are. We are going to keep this anonymous. Uh, your wife still employed, makes 62k as a paralegal, and you both have 20k in your 401k and 14k in hers. Uh, that's a little behind where I would expect. It looks like you're 33 and your wife is 29. Yeah, you're a little bit behind where I'd expect there based on the amount of money that you were making. Um, unless you have meaningful equity in a home. So if you've got, you know, 20% down payment, you're living in a home, etc. That would explain why you're behind there. And then that makes sense to me. But you're probably spending a little too much for the respective salaries that you two have, if that's what you have invested at this point. Uh, can't change that now. Just, you know, could wish that you'd done a little better there for reasons like this. And hopefully you'll be able to do a bit better going forward here. Uh, you're you're going to have to if you don't immediately line up another job. You're going to have to be a little more frugal, make sure what's coming in is going out uh, more slowly than it looks like it has been. Or again, maybe you guys both recently within the last year got 30% plus raises, but generally that would be a little better. Anyway, back to the facts of the case. You've still got 4K left in student loans. That's not much, though uh, you would hope you wouldn't have any at 33, but 4K, you that is quickly enough take quickly enough take careable. Yeah, temporal can speak. Those are words, and she's free and clear. Good for her. Uh, we said she was 29, and you guys don't have or want any kids. That does make this a bit a bit easier financially. So you've applied to at least 40 jobs and haven't gotten any interviews. You're not in any way unable to pay the bills at this point, but you're worried about the relationship if you can't find a job soon. Okay, well, I've got bad news for you. Uh, I, I don't know your wife, so everything could be totally fine there. You could be worried over nothing. I, I don't know her, so I can't definitively say that one way or the other. But I can look at the data from the population at large, and the data from the population at large says that when women get significant raises to make more money than their husband, um, the odds of a couple being divorced within the next two years goes up very significantly, whereas when husbands get raises to make more than their wives or to continue to make more than their wives, the odds of a divorce are unchanged compared to the rest of the population. Uh, we also know women in Western society unfortunately initiate somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of divorces depending on the country that you're in so not great news on that front that is potentially something to worry about just going on the numbers again i don't know your wife you could be worried over nothing everything could be fine there but i'm going to have to work from those because it's the best i have for answering your question here so to avoid to avoid that the there's two real ways out of this. The first way would be, hey, go get a job making good money again, and problem solved, right? You've been out four and a half months. That doesn't look great, but everyone understands what happened. You got laid off during a serious downturn in the economy. Hopefully, potential future employers won't hold that against you too hard. And let's get into how to do that, because if you've only put out 40 plus applications, you're not doing it right. Either you're not spending enough time on it because this is now your full-time job. So that means 40 plus hours a week trying to get a job or you're casting way too narrow of a net for finding your next job. Yes, it's it's hard. It's hard. Unemployment is what still up over 6%. You, It's not an easy thing to do, but you can get a job and you can get a job that pays more than your unemployment because we're going to screen those out at least 
for now. You want to go find something that's making more than those before it makes sense to be taking it. It instead makes more sense to be spending more time applying rather than taking a job that's going to pay you less since I expect that you're still able to pull unemployment if you were just laid off four and a half months ago. So the way you do this, uh, since you're going to need some better structure than you have here, is you spend the first two to three days building a deck of resumes effectively. So let's say you're going to build half a dozen resumes and you're thinking to yourself, okay, Temporal, I'll build half a dozen resumes, but I don't know what I'd build half a dozen resumes for. My experience is as a project manager. You unfortunately didn't tell me more of your history than that, like what your degree is in if you have one or um, what you did before you were a project manager. So I don't have a ton to work with there. So I'm going to walk you through how I would do this if I were going, oh, hey, I need to go get a job using a little more of my experience. You can do this, but you just have to spend the first two or three days thinking about what you've done, looking through job boards to figure out, hey, what sort of jobs are out there that I might not have thought of, look for things related to things you've done or things you've studied or things you've tangentially done, maybe as a volunteer, maybe things you in your free time studied, etc. cetera. You're, you're looking for those things to help figure out what jobs are actually out there because if you're just applying to project manager jobs, you're casting way too narrow of a net and I promise there's more that you can do than that. There are there are jobs out there. They're very competitive to get them, but there are lots of jobs out there that are, hey, we really just need someone that has some business experience or has a degree period, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're competitive. You're fighting against a lot of people. It's easier to have a specialized degree or specialized experience to and get jobs that are, uh, how shall I say, less sought after, but those do exist and you can beat everyone else for them. So spend time, search through the job boards, figure out, okay, what in your experience could you do? And then after you've spent some time doing that, maybe that's four hours, maybe that's eight hours, you're going to go, okay, I've seen these jobs that I think sort of fit, or I see, have seen these job categories, we'll say, that sort of fit what I've done. If I dress up a resume just right, I can make my experience look a little stronger, or I can put a better foot forward in this category of job type, and I can make myself more attractive. And for me, what that would look like is when I put together a resume, um, I actually have done Project Manager, so I have a version of my resume that does look like, oh, Temporal is a project manager. Yep, he has lots of project management experience. He's taken products for a company. He's done what he needed to in terms of making sure there's not scope creep, figuring out what the best go things to add are, working with developers to get those installed, done that type of thing. I have another version of my resume that is more, oh, look, Temporal has Temporal is right on the edge of being an executive. He's rapidly been promoted through a couple companies. He's reported into C-suite people in multiple different positions. He's had lots of people working for him, both onshore and offshore. Yeah, he's totally ready to be knocking on the heels of that. I've also got a version of my resume that is the, oh, look, Temporal is in the criminal justice world. He could go be a police officer, something along those lines. I have a criminal justice degree. I did a bunch of intellectual property work. I put those together in a certain way. And oh, hey, it looks like this is what he should go do. He should go work for, I don't know, let's say customs or DOJ or whatever the case is there. Then I could put another one together that is a sort of entry-level business analyst type thing. Oh, you know, he's worked with databases. He's done some of that intellectual property work, some price monitoring work, etc. And that would be something that makes a lot of sense if I'm going, okay, I don't want to go make the most I've ever gotten. Let me rephrase that. It's not they don't want to go make the most I've ever made from a salary, but I want to be able to apply to jobs that are maybe going to pay in the 50, 60 grand thing. I want to be able to snipe those jobs and that's the right resume for that. Whereas some of my other resumes are things that I'd use if I'm looking more for those. Okay, this is the senior director or this is the junior VP, et cetera, type positions that I'm applying into. Uh, what did I do? I did intellectual, I did the analyst type one. I did the law enforcement type one. I did the uh, knocking on the heels of executive uh, I did law enforcement. 
what would be another one that I could throw out there? Oh, yeah, I can do a intellectual property one there. Hey, strong intellectual intellectual property specialist there. Go do some brand protection type stuff, etc. That's great. That's another more, hey, entry level thing, but it's pretty specialized. Or we can go in the, hey, you know, we can manage up a brand team, has worked with, has supervised lawyers that are doing, okay, trademark registrations, all those good things. So I just came up with five different resumes there, and that's fine. I could come up with a couple more if I had to, but that's really just the point. You go, okay, I now have built five or six different resumes. Okay, you now have those half dozen resumes, and now you're going to go use those, and you are going to apply to these different types of jobs. And that's great. Maybe you've spent two days. Let's say you've spent two days on this, and all you've accomplished is you've built five resumes. That's fine, because now you've laid the groundwork to be able to go through and apply to jobs faster. You've spent 16 plus hours just creating, okay, shouldn't take you 16 hours, but between research and resume customization, we'll call it two days to just set yourself up. Now you're gonna go through and you're gonna start finding these jobs because you've already found the categories. So now you know five, six, seven different categories of jobs that you're looking for. You're doing those searches on the job boards to find, okay, what is here? And then you go, oh, I have my resume. Oh, I have my resume. But of course you're gonna go further than that. A lot of these are gonna either require you to manually fill out their forms, even though you already have the resume. That's how they are. It's easier on their systems than it is for them to scan your resume. It sucks, but you need them more than they need you. That's the unfortunate, re unfortunate reality of uh, high unemployment. So you're going to go through, you're going to do that dance, you're going to fill those out, and you're also going to look if there's a spot for or an ask for a cover letter. And if there is, you're going to customize that cover letter, every single cover letter, you rewrite it every time to either match the buzzwords in the job listing, or if there is, if you're not seeing much in the job listing itself that's on, you know, a Indeed, a Monster, whatever, you're going to go over to the website of the actual company, because that's very easy to find, and you're going to sort of look at their About Us page and see if they have values or buzzwords or things that they think are important, as you can throw those in a cover letter as well. Don't go overboard with the cover letter, but just do a little bit of that. It shouldn't be like, oh, it takes me an hour to write every co each cover letter. No, it, it should take you 10 minutes to write each cover letter. Um, but do the cover letter, have your different resumes, and then you're not just applying to that narrow thing that you go, oh, this is my experience project manager. You've found some other things that you've perhaps stretched your experience a little bit. You're, you're not outright lying, and you're not going to lie in the interviews over what your experience is. But if you if you lead with the right things, describe your job duties the right way, etc., but still honestly, but highlighting the right aspects of your job, uh, you can very much put the right foot forward to make yourself more appealing. Now, this does not mean that you're going to get a, oh, I do this and I make my special resumes and now 50% of the time I'm going to get a callback. N no. You've gone from like a 1% chance when you put in a resume of getting a callback to 1% was high. Let's, let's call that a half a percent chance to a... 3% chance. Um, so you've multiplied your odds by 6 if you're doing this right, which still sucks. I mean, 6% isn't very high. But the thing is, once you've done this, you really get to start going through these. And after that first week, you're easily putting in 40 resumes in in a week for going out getting jobs. So it, it should not be taking you long to go, oh, okay, hey, <sighs> I've put in a bunch of resumes. They're in these fields that I've determined. My resume doesn't suck for these fields because I actually made sure I didn't put in the job for, you know, chief of security for a company with a resume that was that of a project manager. I instead led with stuff that looked a little more criminal justice, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you're probably not going to get that job, but you're putting in a lot of these. You have doctored them to the specific job, either by going, hey, this is the resume. And you can customize your resumes a little bit more to the specific jobs, but you have to do that much faster with your now half dozen templates that you have. You grab the right template and you can customize it just a tweak. And that's what you're going to do. And once you get that call, once you get that interview, once you get whatever, you don't stop. 
until you actually have that offer letter in your hand, it is still your 40 hour a week job to continue going through there and applying for jobs. So this does not stop because you go, oh, hey, I got a second phone interview. So I really think I'm going to get this one. No, there's still three to five candidates. You are absolutely not stopping and going, oh, I really think I'm going to get this one. Until you have that written offer letter in your hand or on your computer screen, you keep going. If you're doing this, you will not be without a job for too long. And even, I won't say more importantly, but almost as important to that is if you're working that hard on it, your wife will notice it and she is more likely to cut you some slack if previously she wasn't. Because I have to admit, I wouldn't be cutting you slack if you'd put in 40 applications in four and a half months and weren't getting too much done other than that. You get a little more slack if you're, you know, you've gone back to school or doing some certifications, etc. But I would want 40 applications on top of, hey, you're working on your certification for something, you're getting of a license or something, you're, you know, getting uh, maybe a paralegal license like she has, though that depends on the state. You don't need those. In all, you don't need those in all states. So that's what you want to do if you're going that route. And that is the route that I would recommend to you uh, for most of the reasons that I already gave about pay, just looking at populations, what does and doesn't work for marriages, etc. There is another route, though. The other route is you become the ultimate house husband, the house husband to put all modern housewives or house husbands to shame. The reason I don't recommend that is that will work for some women. Some women will go, oh my God, you are doing an awesome job around the house. You are making my life way easier. You are being the ultimate support for this family. And that is totally a valuable role. And, you know, I'm the breadwinner and that works out. And that's just fine because you're putting in your fair share of the equation. Some women totally fine like that. Doesn't seem to be the majority, though. Again, looking at the population numbers, I'm not saying that's what ha is happening in the majority of the population, but when you look at what women seem to be attracted to based on their actions, not based on, you know, nice fairy tales that we see in rom-coms, uh, women tend to like it when their husband makes more money than them. But there definitely are exceptions. My, my parents were actually an exception. My stepfather... Uh, did get laid off during a previous recession, and he became the house husband. And there are fantastic things you can do if that is the route you go that significantly decrease. Again, it depends on the woman. It's not going to work for every woman, but significantly decrease the odds of her being unhappy and your marriage being in serious danger. Um, I worry a little bit more about this route for you than I might for some others in that your wife is working as a paralegal and paralegal really has a cap of its ability to move up. It can make more money than 62 grand. Uh, specifically, it can make more money than 62 grand in California, D.C. and I believe Connecticut. Uh, might not be Connecticut. I might need to double check that. <laughs> but... It's not, there's not real serious promotion potential there. It's not like, oh, she's going to go up and be the senior VP or anything like that. Or she's suddenly going to get stock options, make it into the C-suite, anything like that. So, so spending a ton of effort supporting and making the life easier for someone who has sort of a income cap that they can get to is going to be a little harder. That said, if you're really not going to have children, you you guys can live off of what she can make and you can live fine, though your spending is going to have to come down based on what you should have saved and invested by now versus what you do. But here's what you do. If you want to go the house husband route, it is also a serious job. Now, I'm going to be honest, it's less hours and effort than working a full 40 hour plus job because no one actually works 40 hours in a salary job. They work more than that, or at least most people do. Um, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to go, it's not a case of, oh yeah, it'll be great. I'll be the house husband. I'll vacuum and do laundry once a week and I'll just play video games the rest of the time. Yeah, yeah, no, it'll be great. Or maybe I'll throw on some Netflix while I do some chores. No, it's, it's a lot more involved than that. So first things first, 
you are cooking breakfast, dinner, uh, almost every single day of the week. So that should be six plus days of the week. And if you're not on the seventh day, it's because, you know, you're going out or you're going to, you know, a friend's party or something like that, etc. You need to be keeping your family's costs down by doing the grocery shopping and cooking dinner and breakfast, like I said, every day there. And you've also got to make sure that your your recipe book, your internal hay recipes that you can just do from hand. For a bachelor, having a dozen of those is generally enough. We, we feed ourselves fine. We go, oh yeah, there's like 12 things I can cook from memory that I like that are pretty good, etc. If I want something different, I'll go pull out a cookbook. You're going to need to at least double that because it's your job to keep the family's spending on eating out down. And if you've only got three things, a dozen things, six things, whatever that you're cooking both you and her are going to get bored more often and you're going to cave and go out. And then you're failing in your job of helping keep the family's costs down and in cooking. I mean, cooking is now one of your jobs if you choose to go this route. So (laughs) increase your repertoire. You're, of course, going to use cookbooks. Use cookbooks to do that. But you should get to a place where you can pretty comfortably rotate between two dozen, three dozen different meals. That doesn't mean it has to be an exactly equal distribution. There will be things that both you and her like more in your uh, hand of things you can cook effectively, and it's fine to do those more. But if you're not varying it up enough, you and her are going to get sick of those things, and then you'll go right back to the, okay, well, now we're going to go out, etc. So mix it up a bit, two dozen, three dozen different things that you cook. I would also strongly recommend packing lunches for her. Uh, You cannot take it too hard on her if she doesn't eat the lunch that you pack. You just need to adjust, figure out what's going on, etc. You you don't want to be super confrontational about that, but you want to you know, pack lunches, brown bag lunches, because again, you're trying to keep your family's costs down as the house husband. And that's one of the ways you do that. But there are going to be times where someone at the office takes her out to lunch, or she goes out with friends to lunch, or she's just really not feeling it. She's had a stressful day and she wants to go eat lunch, etc. If that's happening like three days a week, that's a problem. Um, And you potentially do want to go, hey, you either need to talk to her or you need to um, figure, but this isn't a super confrontational talk. This is a, hey, what aren't you liking? What type of things would you like? And, you know, there may be some resistance, but again, part of your job is to keep the cost down. Your your leverage isn't great when you're not the one making money, I'm going to be honest. But you're going to do that to figure it out how you can get it to four days a week. She's eating the lunch that you're packing, etc. Uh, so that's what you're going for. <clears throat> okay, so that takes care of food. And, you know, if she just runs out of the house in the mornings with just coffee without a- eating anything, you're failing. You, you want to make sure that you're cooking, you know, maybe you're cooking eggs, maybe you're Maybe the most that she'll take is uh, English muffin or toast or something like that or some piece of fruit. That's fine, but make sure you've you've got that. You've got that in a place that she can grab it. You need to be facilitating her. You need to be facilitating her life being easy at the house so that she can go be the breadwinner because you're not helping add to the bread, quote unquote, of the house. You're just making the bread, the the food bread, not the money bread. Yeah, yeah, bad joke. Okay. (sighs) There's other things that you should be doing too there. So you've got that covered with food. You also are going to look at things and go, okay, of course, you're going to be doing the cleaning, and it's important that you're doing the cleaning not to your standard, because if you're anything like me, like most men, your standard for what's clean is probably down here. Her standard for clean is probably here. That might not be a significant difference, but you need to be bringing at least to her standard, if not to above her standard, with anything that you're doing. Otherwise, you're not going to be getting any credit for having cleaned, et cetera, et cetera. She needs to feel like, yes, she wants to live here. This is taken care of, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to be doing that. You can't be adding to her stress when she's also the sole breadwinner like that. So you're going to do that, clean to to or above her standard, figure out what that is. You're not going to be like asking to figure that out. You, You should have some feel by now. You've been married to her. I don't know for how long you didn't include that, but you're going to have to figure that one out. 
what else do we have here? Uh, then you're going to need to look for other things that you can do to, uh, if you guys own your house because you didn't tell me, look for things you can do to increase the value of the household. That might be better training any pets if you have them. If you have a dog, a cat, or whatever, and your dog isn't fully trained, like it barks too often when it shouldn't, or it jumps up on guests, or it doesn't always sit, or it doesn't always stay, things like that. Well, you've got some time now, and as, you know, the as the support member of the household, you can go better train that pet. Or if you've got a case of, oh, hey, um, what's another example? There's... there's a family of skunks that have moved in under the house. Well, in the past, you might have called an exterminator to deal with that. And you still could if you feel super uncomfortable. But the reality is that's something that you can probably handle. That might seem like, whoa, that's that's wild. I've, I've never done that type of thing before. But you have time to go research how to do that on the internet. And I, I can tell you, hint, hint, there's ways to do that without buying any poison, et cetera, et cetera, without getting sprayed, without them spraying, et cetera, et cetera, to remove, say, 20 skunks that live under your house. Oh, hey, you've added value to your family, to your household by being the exterminator, by dealing with something. Or you could say the same thing with rats. And no, getting rid of rats is not as simple as throwing down a rat trap. They they learn if they, if rats see other rats die, they learn. And that's a problem. So you have to get more creative in how you do it. But you have time to go research and find the answer to that. You can also do carpentry type stuff if you have those skills. If you don't have that skill uh, and you own the house or have equity in the house, you should start learning it. Um, you're you're going to save money like that, and it's expected that that is something that you can contribute. If you're going, hey, I fixed the deck, so our house is now worth more if we sell it. We didn't have to pay a handyman to go do that. We didn't have to pay a contractor to go do that, etc. That's providing value, assuming you're doing it to a decent standard. You may need to do a little practice before you actually do work on the house because uh, <laughs> it's not going to be good for your marriage if you fix the deck or fix the gutter or something like that and it looks worse than before. Uh, uh, Fixing someone else's bad work is harder than getting it right in the first place. But again, you have the time to study how to get it right, to do some practice, and to go do these things. Uh, so yeah, that's really what that would be. Um, I think that's probably enough. Again, I do recommend the first route, make your full-time job finding a job over the second route, but the second route is an option. If you were to go the second route, I would consider doing what you can to increase your wife's earning potential. And I think, yeah, I think the three highest earning places for a paralegal right now are California, DC, and Connecticut. California requires specific licensing that she won't have because she you need that licensing for California. Uh, I think DC does too. Doesn't matter. California and DC are both very high cost of living. Connecticut is higher than normal for the country, but not as high as those other two. And is currently the highest or second highest paying. So consider relocating to there if that's the route that you're going to go, that second route where she's the sole income earner, et cetera. That's, that's going to make your life easier. Um, and, you know, you've got to do what you can to decrease your family spending both uh, now and if you take that second route, both now while you don't have a job and if you take that second route because that is that is your job. Your job is to be the support. Uh do all those things that helps. Do the family's taxes, or at least um, enable the family's taxes to be done easier. You you want to be making those things as easy as possible. You know, you're doing the oh hey, let me go deal with this thing on the computer rather than hiring. Uh, anything like that that you can go hey, I can learn this and do it. You're gonna do instead of hiring someone else to do it because your job is to be that family support and help lower your costs, etc. And to make her job and to make her job and her life easier. For example, if she needs to take her car into the shop, you if you guys have two cars, you're going to uh, swap cars with her. She's going to take your car into the office, and you're going to take her car to the shop and wait while they fix it. If you guys have one car, you're going to drive her to work that day, then drive it to the shop to go get fixed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then pick her up at the end of the day. Your job is to make it as easy if you want to go that route and you know be the super house husband that would... You do everything you can. If you do everything I described, it's not your fault if you get divorced, which doesn't 
mean anything. If you get divorced, you still get divorced. Uh, if you guys are miserable, you're still miserable. But it's you did what you could at that rate. So yeah, that's what I've got. If you guys have other questions you want answered, you know the drill. You can either DM me and I will quote you a price, or you can throw something down in the comments below. And if you're lucky, I'll pick it up as a freebie. I do that every once in a while. Thanks, guys. Tim Portal out.